But yes, as well as the book to help us navigate this topic today, to help us navigate this proverbial minefield, if you like, we have Jorge Martin, who's uh, on the International Secretariat of the newly founded RCI. He's going to introduce the topic for about 45 minutes plus 45 minutes translation. Then we'll go for a break and then we'll have time for questions, contributions and discussion before Jorge replies. And without further ado, I hand over to Jorge. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm guessing it's good morning for some of those who are watching from home. Just before I start, uh, but just before uh, we started this session, a comrade came up to me and said, he asked me whether the, this session was going to be mainly theoretical. So, uh, so what I want to say is that if anyone's come here thinking that I'm going to teach you how to take apart and put together an assault rifle, this is not the session. <laughs> I know, I know how to do it, but I won't, I won't teach you <laughs> right now. So, uh, uh, of course, the question of war is back on the agenda. It's now become a, the main political issue in many countries. There are, there are many wars going on around the world. Uh, but, but above all, the war in Ukraine and uh, the massacre in Gaza are obviously on the headlines and they're, they're contributing to the politicization of a whole layer of people. And we have to say like, that, that like every time that the question of war is on the agenda, enormous confusion is set on the, on the workers' movement and, and, and on the left. Now, uh, what, what I'm going to do mainly in this uh, session is go through Lenin's writings on uh, war, which, uh, which he developed uh, during World War I. Because even though wars are different and they have different features, different characteristics, I think that from a careful study of uh, those writings by Lenin, you can draw some general Marxist principles on how to approach the question of war. Now, as Lenin uh, explained, the, the classical Marxist position on war was originally developed by Marx and Engels themselves. But that was at a time when capitalism still played a relatively progressive war. And there were a number of uh, wars that were waged by the bourgeoisie that were progressive wars, in some cases even revolutionary wars. Uh, and, and Lenin says that mainly this, this was the case in, in the period between the Great French Revolution and the Paris Commune. He says in that, in that period, most wars in Europe were wars of a progressive bourgeois national liberating character and that the position that uh, all honest revolutionary Democrats and also all socialists was to sympathize with the success of that country, that is, of that ruling class, which had helped to overthrow or undermine the most dangerous foundation of feudalism, absolutism, and the oppression of other nations. So basically, uh, the Marxists recognized that there were progressive wars that socialists, but not only socialists, revolutionary Democrats had, had to support. However, critically, of course, even in this period, the policy, the policy of Marx and uh, Engels was one of uh, no mixing of the banners, i.e. class independence of the proletariat. But nevertheless, it's true that there were a number of wars that uh, the workers should, should give uh, critical support to. However, Lenin explained, uh, by the time of the First World War, the situation had changed radically. By this time, Europe was dominated by different imperialist uh, powers. And the idea of national defense or, or national war was by this time uh, mostly, uh, mostly a fig leaf that the ruling class used to cover their own real, real reasons and interests. Le Lenin said it was a question of different sets of slave owners fighting for a more just distribution of slaves. And therefore these wars were completely reactionary and had to be opposed by the working class. The second international, the Socialist International, was uh, formally based on these principles. And of course, the second international discussed thoroughly uh, the, 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 the coming uh, First World War, which everyone could see was coming. At the Stuttgart Conference in 1907, the Socialist International adopted a resolution which said, wars are part of the very nature of capitalism, and they will cease only when the capitalist system is abolished. This is still relevant. This is still true today. And it contains many different uh, wisdoms in, in this short sentence. First, the real character of the war. 
Uh, the war, war, the imperialist war was, was a war for the division of uh, markets, spheres of influence, uh, fields of investment, sources of raw materials. And, and war was uh, the logical and inevitable consequence of the imperialist phase of capitalism. And therefore, as a consequence of this, the only effective way to fight against war was to fight against capitalism, which is the root cause of war. The main, the, main, uh, the main part of the resolution at the Stuttgart Congress ha had been drafted by August uh, Bebel. But the resolution was, was posed somehow in very general and uh, abstract uh, uh, manner. The Russian delegation, which was made up of uh, Lenin and Martov, put together a number of amendments, which were defended together with Rosa Luxemburg in the, in the Commission on Militarism at this conference. And Lenin, Lenin, in an article about the Stuttgart conference, he explained the main content of these amendments. And I think that this is very, very uh, uh, relevant. One, militarism is the chief weapon of class oppression. And as a result of this, there is, there is the need for the Socialist International to conduct anti-militarist propaganda amongst the youth. In fact, at that time, in many socialist parties in Europe, when young people were being conscripted into military service, there were meetings of the labor movement in each uh, town and village, and the young, uh, the, the sons of the working class were sent off to military service by taking an oath not to fight against workers of other countries. The amendments also stress the point that the social democrats should not only try to prevent war from breaking out, or to secure the speediest termination of wars that had already begun, but also that they should use the crisis created by war to hasten the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. And this idea was uh, approved unanimously by the Stuttgart Congress of the Socialist International. Uh, but this, the debates about war at the Stuttgart Congress didn't finish here. Lenin and uh, Luxembourg also made a point of answering uh, the French Hervé, the French delegate, who was an ultra-left at this uh, point and had developed some semi-anarchist, pacifist uh, ideas. And Hervé basically argued that the workers' movement should uh, agitate for peace and against war, but he did so in a very abstract manner, in, in, a, in a moralistic way, isn't it? That, that, that war is bad and we should oppose war. And he also developed this idea, which was very common amongst the anarchists and anarcho-syndicalists at that time. He said that uh, uh, war had to be combated by a gener an all-out general strike of the working class. Now, Lenin replied to this, and he explained that, first of all, it was very important to stress that war is the product of capitalism. It's not just something that's morally wrong uh, or is the result of the evilness of, of the rulers. Also, he stressed there are reactionary wars, but there are also revolutionary wars. Socialists are not against war in general, and sometimes they will have to wage revolutionary wars. And then in answering this idea of the general strike against the war, Lenin said that the, 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 the possibility, that the possibility of answering war by the, by the working class depend, depended on the type of crisis created by the war. Because what usually happens, as it was to happen in the First World War, was that at the beginning of the war, the dominant mood is, is that of uh, chauvinism. The ruling class always prepares any war with a massive barrage of propaganda. And this has an impact on the masses of the working uh, people. And finally, also Lenin, in, in uh, replying to Hervé, he said, the, the, the point was not to replace war by peace, because this will mean, this will mean replacing imperialist war by imperialist peace. He said all imperialist wars will eventually end when the warring parties are exhausted or one of them has achieved its war aims. It's no longer able to advance anymore. But imperialist peace will only reflect the given balance of forces between different powers at that particular time and will be just an interlude until another imperialist war in which this uh, balance of forces was going was to be changed again. In fact, it is, uh, it is ironic to see that Hervé, who, uh, who had this semi-anarchist, pacifist position, and did not really understand war from, from a material uh, point of view, from a Marxist point of view, then in 1914, 
rushed to join the, the camp of national defense in France. But anyway, this resolution was passed at the, at the 1907 Stuttgart Congress, which we, we have published in the, in the book. It was then uh, repeated at the Copenhagen uh, Congress in 1910. And a very similar resolution containing extracts from, from these two resolutions was also passed at the Basel Congress in, in 1912. Uh, some comrades from Basel in the, in the audience. Uh, so, so very clearly, the Socialist International, in words, had declared that the war that was coming was an imperialist war and workers had to oppose it. But as we know, when the war broke out in August uh, 1914, the Socialist International completely betrayed its own uh, resolutions and all the major parties of the International, starting with, uh, with the German party, the French party, the Belgian party, the British party, they all, the same Socialist parties that had voted for all these resolutions, then went on to, to su support the imperialist war, support their own bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie's interest in the war, voted for the war credits, declared a truce in the class struggle in the national interest, entered governments of national unity with the ruling class, and basically succumbed to social uh, chauvinism everywhere. This came as a big shock to everyone. It was not uh, expected. There's an anecdote that says that when, when uh, Lenin received the copy of the, of the German uh, Social Democratic paper, which had uh, the, contained the news of the voting of the war credits, he, he couldn't believe it. And he thought it was a forgery of the, of the chief of staff of the German army in order to fool the workers. In fact, the German party and all the other parties submitted to war censorship, submitted their papers to war censorship. And the paper carried a stamp that said, by permission of the German general staff. The truth is that for a period of time, even though these parties were officially defending Marxist uh, ideas, they had been thoroughly infected by uh, reformism. And this was a question that preoccupied Lenin throughout this uh, period. How did that happen? And in, and in imperialism, his book on imperialism and, and all the writings of this period, Lenin explains that the roots of chauvinism in the workers' movement are linked to the rise of imperialism, that the super profits derived from the exploitation of the colonies allowed the ruling class in imperialist countries to buy off a section of the ruling class at the top of the, of the, sorry, at the, top of the, of the working class and, and its organizations. Uh, social democratic members of parliament, trade union uh, leaders, local councillors, and so on. And Lenin described them as uh, labor lieutenants of capital. Uh, that is, agents of the ruling class within the workers' uh, movement. Now, those who remained, th there were some who didn't succumb to, to chauvinism, but they were a very small minority. The, the two most important parties that voted, uh, that refused to vote the war credits, was the Russian uh, Bolsheviks, who had some deputies in the, in the Duma, and the Serbian party. Uh, and then there were isolated individuals who resisted the war pressure in other countries. And it's worth mentioning, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, James Connolly in Ireland, John McLean in Scotland, Eugene Debs in the United States, the Marxist, the Balkan Marxist uh, Christian Rakowski, and, uh, and very few others. Now, uh, there, were, there were also others, particularly in non-warring parties, uh, in non-warring countries or countries that were not so involved in the war originally, uh, who opposed the war or took a neutral position, but they did so from, from a very weak pacifist uh, position. So you can imagine the situation. Lenin was completely isolated at this uh, time. He very quickly moved to uh, neutral uh, Switzerland and he started the task uh, which might have seemed at that time like an all uh, a mighty uh, task in front of uh, him of re-establishing the Marxist principles on uh, war. And, uh, and the first part of that task was establishing theoretical, theoretical clarity. And for this reason, he not only attacked the social chauvinists, but also if you read uh, Lenin's writings in this uh, period, you will see that he used perhaps his uh, strongest uh, language against against the centrist, i.e. against those who vacillated, those who said, yeah, we, we are against the war, but there's not much that we can do. We are against the war, but we shouldn't break the international. We shouldn't have a split. 
And Lenin was able to use, uh, was capable of using some very colorful uh, language for these people. Uh, and the main ideas that Lenin uh, and the, the center, which, which he strongly criticized, was represented by people like Kautsky, who formally opposed the war, but ma made excuses for those who voted for the war, and uh, he was not prepared to go all the way. Now, the main ideas that Lenin fought for in this period were one, the, about the character of the war. This is an imperialist war, and workers in all countries must oppose it. Two, the leaders of the social democracy have, have betrayed, and this needs to be said very clearly. And as a consequence of this, the socialist international is dead and a new international must be formed. Re remember that this is in 1914, at the darkest hour of, of the war and uh, social chauvinism. And he then also added that the only way to end the war was through revolution, turning the war into a civil war. And as I said before, he also fought against the, the, the pacifist ideas of some, some of these uh, who were against the war. Now, over, over the period of time, we're talking here that the, the first writings of Lenin about the war were in, in September of uh, 1914. But over the period of time, as the war was becoming a bit m longer than anyone had expected, uh, opposition voices started to raise in a number of uh, parties and they were growing in confidence. A conference of socialists opposed to the war was called by the Swiss and Italian uh, parties, which took place in Zimmerwald from September the 5th to September the 8th, 1915. Are any comrades from Zimmerwald here? No? Okay. And in preparation for this conference, Lenin wrote a pamphlet, which is called Socialism and War, which I recommend everyone to read. And this pamphlet was distributed to all uh, delegates, translated into several languages, published in uh, German uh, in, in an underground manner. And here again went over through over the main points of this uh, of this uh, Marxist approach to war. And he said, st starting with the idea that war is the continuation of politics by other means, and therefore, in the same way that the working class must be independent in the political struggle, it must take an independent position in relation to the war. He also said something which is very important, which is still relevant today. He said the position. The attitude of the workers, the Marxists towards the war, is not determined by who fired the first shot, because in fact, or who is the aggressor, because in fact, in an imperialist war, the ruling class of each country will always find an excuse, and if they can't find one, they will fabricate one to justify the war. No, nobody goes to war as the aggressor. They all are the injured party in order to try to present the war as a defensive uh, war. I mean, the, the first Gulf War in 1991 was carried out on, on what excuse? Uh, Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Iraq was the aggressor. The, the, the second uh, Iraq war was carried out on an even flimsier excuse that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and uh, they were 45 minutes from uh, firing them onto the European capitals which was later on proven to be a complete fal falsification, deliberate falsification. But you can go uh, much further back, the, the Vietnam War and the Tonkin uh, Gulf incident. You can go all the way back to, to the, to the Spanish-US uh, war in uh, Cuba and the sinking of the, how was it called? The ship they sank, can't remember. Uh, they always find an excuse, and, and uh, the workers should not be fooled by that, but, but look at the real cause of the war and the real interest behind the war before taking a position. I mean, if you look at the Ukraine war today, uh, Russia was the first one who crossed the border of uh, Ukraine. But that's only if you take that particular incident. Uh, if you go back to, to 2014, the Kiev regime used the army against its own population in the Donbas, in the so-called anti-terrorist operation. And so on. In fact, if you if you if you want to find the, the if you want to go all the way back in the causal sequence of, of excuses for the war, you will never end. In this pamphlet, Lenin also insists on another idea, which is that even even in the epoch of imperialism, there are there are progressive wars, and he mentions specifically the wars of national liberation by oppressed colonial peoples, which have to be supported. And also, he poses a question, which uh, is I think is quite far-sighting at that, at that point, it says, if workers take power in one country, then they might decide to wage a revolutionary war of national defense against the aggressive bourgeois trying to put down workers' power. And that certainly will be a progressive revolutionary war that, that workers support. 
There's another very important point that Lenin makes here, which is that, that in imperialist wars, always the rights of small nations are used as an excuse for, for war. In this case, World War I, it was the case of poor little Belgium and poor little Serbia. Now, uh, this has parallels with uh, the fate of poor little Ukraine, which is being used as an excuse for waging a proxy war between NATO and uh, Russia. And this is a very important uh, point. In fact, Lenin says that if you take World War I, the only place where you could say this is a, a genuine, justified war of national defense, he says that is Serbia. Serbia had been attacked by Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. He says if you take that in isolation, that will be a progressive war on the part of Serbia that we will support. But he says, he says, from a Marxist dialect dialectical point of view, you cannot take things in isolation. And he says, the war in Serbia is not uh, uh, an isolated uh, factor. It has to be taken into consideration. The fact that behind Serbia is Russian Tsarism and its ambitions in uh, southern uh, Europe. And therefore, it's, it's also a reactionary uh, war. And here we have another very interesting uh, question which is the, the, posi the position taken by Serbian uh, Marxists. Imagine the situation, right? Your country, which is a small country, is being invaded by a big imperialist uh, power. There is a mood of national uh, defense, naturally. And Trotsky describes what happened at the Serbian uh, parliament when they voted war credits. They were, they were I think, 200, uh, 200 uh, deputies. And this vote was taken on a roll call, i.e. the name of each deputy was read, and then they, they said yes to war credits, until they reached the social democratic deputy who voted against. And uh, he was basically lynched, you know, by, by, by the mass media, by public opinion. And there is a letter that Dusan uh, Popovic, one, one of the leaders of the Serbian uh, Marxists, he wrote a letter a year later to uh, Christian Rakowski, the Balkan uh, Marxist, which was, was published by Trotsky in a paper he edited in uh, Paris called, uh, na called, uh, what's it called? Nashes Lobo. And in this letter, uh, uh, Dusan Popovic explains that the Serbian Marxists, despite the massive pressure of public opinion, took this position because they knew that the, the war in uh, Serbia was the beginning of the, of the great slaughter of the European uh, proletariat, and they did not want to be responsible in any way for that. I will say that there are strong parallels with the position that should have been adopted by Marxists today in Ukraine. But unfortunately, this was not the, not the case. Yes. Um... Lenin in this pamphlet also, also, as I said before, criticizes very strongly the centrists for their vacillation, but particularly on one point, he said, there can be no trust in the old leaders of the international, because you see the idea was, okay, now there's a war, we're fighting each other, workers from one country against workers in another country, therefore the socialist international cannot work in these conditions, but once the war is over, we'll reestablish the international and we'll all meet again in international meetings and pass resolutions. Lenin said, Lenin said, this is absolutely unacceptable. This, this is a betrayal and should be spelled out in so many words. And therefore the task is to prepare for a new international. And uh, we have discussed this in another session, the, the founding of the, of the communist international. But you see the idea of the need for an international was already present in 1914. It was arrived at from, from a theoretical analysis of the situation, but it could not be implemented until 1919, until after the Bolsheviks had taken power and proven in practice that those policies were, were working. Okay, there's other things that Lenin says in this pamphlet, including the question of fraternization of uh, soldiers from different countries, which he highlights. He also stresses that since democratic rights have been completely suppressed in all uh, warring uh, countries, the social democracy must organize itself uh, in an underground illegal manner. This is, this is important because, because uh, as I said, the, the German social democracy, for, for instance, had, had accepted all the limitations to democratic rights, censorship of the press and everything. The Zimmerwald conference was, was a very confused affair. The, the genuine internationalists, the genuine Marxists who followed Lenin were in, in, a, in a minority at this conference. 
In fact, one, one of the German delegates who belong to the right wing of the Zimmerwald Conference, he said that if the manifesto included a call for socialist deputies to, to vote against war credits, he will walk out of the conference. And this was a guy who was supposed to be against the, against the war. I, they were against the war just in words. Finally, a, a joint statement was agreed, which contained some of the most important ideas of the left. Uh, th this, uh, this manifesto had been drafted by uh, uh, Trotsky in, in a commission. T Trotsky was present at this conference, representing this Nashes Lobo uh, group in, in, from Paris. But the manifesto was very vague in terms of, of what needed to be done uh, and the practical tasks that, that arose from, from it. So in the end, the, the left voted for the main manifesto, but they, they also issued a couple of additional statements clarifying their position. And they basically said that they reserved their right to, to put forward a full position to the whole working class, regardless of, of, uh, of uh, the agreed position, which, which they still consider to be a step forward. Yeah. Um, after the, the Zimmerwald conference came the, the Kintal conference about nine, nine, seven months later in, in uh, 1916. The, the position here was a bit more favorable to, to the left. And therefore, the, the manifesto that was adopted at Kintal included an, an, uh, 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 an open call for socialist deputies to, to vote uh, against war credits, to break with governments of national uh, unity. And also, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, time, the, there was also a debate about this question of the new international. And still here, the right wing and the center of the, of the Zimmerwald left, of the anti-war uh, socialist, they were still not clear on this question. And they said that they, they uh, proposed that the International Socialist Bureau should uh, start to meet again and the left should fight within that body. While, while Lenin insisted that, that the new international needed to be uh, found. So as you can see, in general, these two conferences were very confused and reflected the general confusion, confusion in, the, in the labor movement at that time, even amongst those who were nominally against the war. And it is in this context that, that Lenin thought that it was necessary to adopt the sharpest possible formulation in order to bring clarity. And it is here that one of the most misunderstood uh, parts of Lenin came about, the idea the idea of revolutionary defeatism. This was first formulated in, in the declaration of the Russian uh, party that Lenin uh, wrote, and it, and it said the following. It says, to us Rus Russian social democrats, there, can, there cannot be the slightest doubt that from the standpoint of the working class and the toiling masses of all nations of Russia, the defeat of the Tsarist monarchy, the most reactionary and barbarous of governments, will be the lesser evil. And then later on in other writings, he said, in general, in all warring countries, the defeat of one's own government is the lesser evil. He, he was, uh, I mean, this was also misunderstood at the time because many uh, German social democrats said, yeah, what Lenin is saying is right. The, the Russian uh, czarist uh, autocracy is the most barbarous regime in uh, Europe. And therefore, we should support our own ruling class in Germany, to, which is war in, at war against uh, Russia. So that's why, that's why Lenin, in, in a later writing, he said, said from the point of view of, of the workers in all countries, the, the defeat of their own ruling class is the, the lesser evil. But as I said, th this was extremely misunderstood at the time and now. What Lenin was trying to do, as I said, was to use the sharpest formulation to bring clarity amongst the advanced layers of the, of the movement. At this time, he was not addressing the masses. He had no means whatsoever of doing that. He was in contact by correspondence with a handful of leading uh, Bolsheviks back home, which in turn were very isolated from the masses. Uh, uh, and uh, he also clarified, by the way, that the defeat of one's own government did not mean blowing up bridges, organizing unsuccessful strikes in the war industries, activities, foolish activities, which he described as helping the government defeat the revolutionaries. In fact, what he meant was that, that in war times, as in peace times, the agitation of the social democrats, the, the, the Marxists at that time, for the interests of the working class should not be limited by any considerations 
that by the workers going on uh, struggle, they will weaken their own government and help the defeat of that government in war. Uh, so it was an idea mainly directed against the social truce. The social chauvinist said, yes, the interests of the working class are very important, but the interests of the nation are now much more dangerous and we should therefore postpone the class struggle. Lenin said, the opposite is true. The interests of the working class are foremost, regardless of what impact they have on, on the war conducted by the government. There is, a, um, there is an academic which has written a book analyzing the propaganda that the Bolsheviks carried out in uh, Russia during the war. And he's looked at all the leaflets that were published between January 15 and February 17. And he says that not a single one of these leaflets mentions the defeat of the, of the, of the government being the lesser evil. What do these leaflets concentrate on? They concentrate on attacking the government, attacking the anti-working class policies of the government, advocating revolutionary struggle against the government as the only way to put an end to the war, and stressing the slogans of a democratic republic, the eight-hour day, and the distribution of the land. This was the concrete application of this uh, idea. In fact, if you look at it, th this idea, which uh, is taken by many to be the, 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 the cornerstone of, of Leninism, when Lenin, when Lenin wrote his draft declaration, which he wanted to put to the, to the Zimmerwald conference, didn't mention this at all. In fact, what he says is that socialists should use the masses growing desire for peace in order to intensify the revolutionary agitation and not shy away in that agitation from considerations of the defeat of their own country. I, he puts the same idea, but in a negative uh, manner. In fact, if you look at, if you look at this sentence where, where he's talking about the desire, using the, the masses desire for peace, it seems to be in contradiction with many of his other writings from the period where he attacks those uh, confused socialists who, who want to struggle for peace in abstract. But in fact, uh, there is no contradiction because he's talking about the desire of the masses for peace, not the confused slogans of the pacifist, uh, opportunist uh, leaders of the movement. And then when, uh, when the revolution broke out in Russia in February 17, and Lenin came back uh, in April, you will not find any other place in Lenin's writings where this uh, slogan or formulation appears about the defeat of one's own country. Why? No, not because the idea was wrong, but because now Lenin was trying to put the same idea, but he was addressing the masses. He was not trying to educate a small number of, uh, of cadres, and therefore he had to take into account the genuine uh, defenses mood that existed amongst the, the masses. Also, there had been a big change in Russia, which Lenin explained. He said, after the February Revolution, Russia had gone from being the most reactionary uh, country in uh, Europe to the most democratic republic. And the masses that had carried out that revolution genuinely wanted to defend it. Against what? Against the danger that the German uh, Kaiser would uh, invade their country and drown the revolution in blood. Does this, does this mean that Lenin, after April or after February, became a defensist? No, he did not. In fact, if you read all, all his uh, articles from this period, he's very clear on this. We cannot make any concession to defensism, but this is what he says. In view of the undoubted existence of a defensist mood amongst the masses, who recognize the war only of necessity and not for the sake of conquest, we must explain to them, most circumstantially, persistently and patiently that the war cannot be ended unless capital is overthrown. This is a, a completely different way of formulating the same idea. But the idea remains the same. What Lenin is saying is you, you, want, uh, you want to defend the revolution, you want to defend the conquest of the revolution, you want, you want uh, to defend the country against foreign aggression. The only way to do that is if the workers take power. He says, when the worker says that he wants to defend the country, he voices the oppressed man's instinct. In fact, on a number of occasions in, uh, in that period, between February and October, there was a slanderous campaign against the Bolsheviks to say that they were German agents. And this campaign specifically said, accused the Bolsheviks of spreading disorganization within the army. 
And the Bolsheviks issued a statement, uh, a leaflet, which they circulated in the army, that said the following, Bef beware of those who, posing as Bolsheviks, will try to provoke you to riots and disturbances. The real Bolsheviks call you to conscious revolutionary struggle, not riots. So this was a very fine line that they were, that they were walking through. And the main argument is the workers must take power to solve any of the problems. Problems of peace, land, and bread. They say, Lenin also explained that uh, the fact that uh, Milyukov and Gutschow have taken power, i.e. the direct representatives of the bourgeois, the capitalists, does not, change, does not change the imperialist character of the war on the part of Russia. And we are still uh, completely, uh, completely opposed to this, uh, to this government. In fact, later on in, in 1918 and in 1921, Le Lenin went on to explain this change of uh, slogans. And I don't have the time to give you all the quotes, but, but there is one that maybe summarizes. It says, in 1921, at the Congress of the Comintern, he was discussing with some uh, foreign delegations. And he said, at the beginning of the war, we Bolsheviks adhered to a single slogan, that of civil war. We branded as a traitor everyone who did not support the idea of civil war. And you can certainly read these words in, uh, in Lenin's writings. He says, but when we came back to Russia in March 17, we changed our position entirely. And what's the reason for that? He says, when we returned to Russia and spoke to the peasants and workers, we realized that they all stood for the defense of the homeland. But this was in a completely different sense from the Mensheviks. We could not describe these ordinary workers and peasants as traitors. And this is the important point. He says, our original stand at the beginning of the war was correct. It was important to form a definite and resolute core. Our subsequent stand was correct too, because it proceeded from the assumption that the masses had to be won over, i.e. one slogan or one formulation was useful for educating the cadres, the other one was necessary in order to explain to the masses. Uh, and it is in this context that uh, Lenin issued some very sharp criticisms of Trotsky. And if you read the volume, uh, we have included, I think, one, one or two texts which deals with this question. And uh, you maybe, uh, your, your hair might uh, rise uh, uh, if you read the language that Lenin uses against Trotsky. Now, on this question, the difference was the following. As I said, Lenin was addressing a small core of uh, cadres that needed to be educated, educated. But Trotsky was the editor of a daily newspaper uh, addressed to the Russian uh, audience, an, an anti-war paper with a clear position. Uh, and this is another interesting uh, story, which we don't have the time to go into, of how a small group of uh, emigres were able to produce a daily paper in the middle of the war in uh, Paris. And there is, uh, I think it's Luna Charsty, which explains, explains, the, explains the, 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 the mechanics of how that worked. But anyway, that's, that's not the subject of this, of this uh, talk. But they were addressing the masses. They, were address, they, were, they, they had a, a much bigger audience that they were talking to. So, for instance, while Lenin was criticizing the slogan of peace, uh, and he said, no, what we want is civil war, Trotsky was actually using the slogan of peace. And this might seem like an irreconcilable uh, difference. But in fact, if you look at it in, in detail, they were defending exactly the same idea. Because what Trotsky was saying is the only effective, the only, the only consistent way of fighting for peace is fighting for the overthrow of capitalism, which is basically the same idea expressed for a different uh, audience. But there is one question in which uh, Trotsky was wrong and Lenin was right, which Trotsky later admitted. And that is that at this time, Trotsky still had many illusions that it was possible to reunite, reunite the party. For instance, amongst the Mensheviks, there were some that opposed the war, like Martov. And he thought that on the basis of this, the party could be reunited. But he was completely wrong. And Lenin was very right in his uh, very sharp criticism of this idea. Because in fact, what happened was the following. Even though Martov had come out against the war, Martov refused to break with the pro-war uh, uh, Mensheviks, people in the organizing committee and others, some of whom had a vacillating position, some of whom were openly for the war. And these people in turn refused to break with Plehanov, who had adopted a completely pro-war position from the beginning, a pro-Russian uh, position from the beginning. 
this was not uh, possible. Unity on these grounds was not possible. There's another, I think, is very important part of, of all this question of Lenin and, and war. And this is that when the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, one of the first things they did was, was to issue a, a decree on peace, which included one of the things they had promised, which was the repudiation and publication of all the secret war treaties. And this was really embarrassing for the imperialists of different countries. Britain, France, and Russia had promised Italy a part of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire in exchange for its participation in the war. And then there were a number of other agreements, like the Constantinople Agreement and the sykes picot Agreement, in which Britain, France, and Russia had agreed amongst themselves the division of the Ottoman Empire in secret, despite the fact that they had at the same time promised the Arabs support in the struggle for national uh, liberation from the Ottoman uh, Empire. And so this is, this is the history of the betrayal of the imperialists of, of the course of Arab uh, liberation, which is part of the roots to uh, the conflict in Palestine. And this is always the case. The big powers, when it comes to war, they use the small nations, uh, making them promises, a small change or as, as pawns in the struggle amongst each other, only to completely betray them when they're no longer useful. There's a very strong warning there for the Syrian Kurds, which have become allies of US imperialism. And there's a very strong warning there as well for, for the Ukrainian working people, which have become allies of uh, NATO, but which NATO will drop once this is no longer a tenable proposition. So another interesting uh, point in all these writings by, by Lenin is that in all, in all the agitation, particularly in the year 1917, the Bolsheviks said, when we come to power, when we come to power, we will uh, propose a democratic peace without annexations. And if, if the warring uh, parties do not agree to this, then we will be prepared to wage a revolutionary war against imperialism. But of course, this is very nice on uh, the paper. When it came to practice, this idea was completely uh, uh, unrealizable. You see, the masses in Russia had been fighting for peace. They were tired of uh, war. And when peace was decreed, the soldiers fled from the front. They went back to the countryside. Most of them were peasants. They had just been granted the land. And it was extremely difficult for the Bolsheviks in power to hold uh, the line. And here came the debate of the Brest-Litovsk uh, Litovsk, uh, agreement, where the ultra-lefts, uh, Bukharin and, uh, and others, advocated a revolutionary war against Germany. Incidentally, at this point, people talk about, oh, Lenin is the predecessor of Stalin. The methods of Lenin led to Stalinism. But in this period, in early 1918, when the country was threatened by, by famine, by foreign invasion, the beginning of a civil war, uh, the ultra-lefts had a daily paper called The Communist. No, uh, no, relation, to, <laughs> no relation to the current uh, paper. They had a daily paper in which they openly advocated their ideas. This debate took place openly inside the party, but also in the Soviets, which were composed from by many delegates who were not Bolsheviks. In any case, Lenin had a position in this debate of saying, we need to go for an immediate peace, whatever the conditions, because we are unable to wage any war at all. And if we delay, the Germans will advance and the front will collapse. Trotsky had uh, an in-between position. He said, we cannot wage a revolutionary war, but we should delay the peace negotiations as long as possible to allow us to carry out revolutionary propaganda amongst the German soldiers and, and prepare a revolution in uh, Germany. And you see there were different votes taken, uh, but the, the, the proof of uh, the, the correctness of any theory or any proposition is in reality in practice, not in votes. Trotsky's position won at the beginning, neither peace nor war, but obviously, but obviously the German high command were not uh, stupid. They, they could see what was the real balance of forces on the ground and they started to advance. And as they started to advance, the, 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 the Soviet, uh, the, the, the Russian army started to collapse. And then very quickly, they had to sign a peace agreement in, in the worst possible conditions. I will say that Lenin's writings on the struggle against imperialist war 
are extremely relevant for today. But I wanted to also mention another time in which uh, these ideas were put into practice. And that is dur during the Second World War. During the Second World War, Trotsky developed a set of uh, ideas, set of policies, which became known as the proletarian military policy. And I think that this was a brilliant application of Lenin's ideas on, on the question of uh, war to the specific conditions of the Second World War. The starting point that, uh, of, of Trotsky was this, the whole society is becoming militarized. We, we're not talking here about a war in Ukraine that takes place far away that our governments support but do not send troops to, uh, uh, with the exception of, of certain countries, of course. But, but we're talking here about, uh, about the, the mobilization of millions of uh, men into the army, the drafting of millions of uh, women into the factories. The, the whole society was dominated by militarism. The war economy, war production becoming the dominant uh, factor. The state requisitioning private uh, companies. Because incidentally, uh, the capitalists talk about the free market and free competition. But when it comes to anything serious, like a war or a pandemic, the state needs to intervene and direct the economy, force the capitalists to do something that might not be in the, in the immediate uh, interest in order to defend the general interests of the, of the class. So Trotsky said the whole society is becoming militarized. The working class cannot be outside of this. There were at that time some people who are advocated objections con uh, uh, the, 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 they were objecting to the war on conscientious uh, grounds and refused to go to the army. Le Trotsky said, that's silly because that separates the most conscious elements of the working class were already against the war from the, gener from the class as a whole. And he said, workers must go with their class. But of course, this, this was a war that was uh, being presented as a war against fascism. And of course, many ordinary workers were what Lenin will describe honest defensists. They certainly didn't want fascist uh, Germany to conquer the whole uh, world and, and sub subject them to, to a military dictatorship, destroy their organizations. And so, the, so Trotsky developed a series of uh, slogans that will, that will connect the program of Marxism in relation to imperialist war with the consciousness of the, of the masses. And this uh, policy, proletarian military policy, was uh, applied brilliantly by the British uh, Trotskyists led by Ted Grant and, and other comrades. And in fact, in Britain, there was a debate about this question. There was a, a group, smaller group, the, the RSL, uh, Revolutionary Socialist League, and they said, no, our main slogan must be the defeat of our own country is the lesser evil. And they wanted to use this as an agitation slogan in the, in the factories, in the trade union branches and so on. But anyone who heard this at that time could only understand one thing. So you want Nazi Germany to defeat uh, democratic Britain. And so obviously these people defended this position, not in the trade union branches or on the streets or on the factories, but from the comfort of the sitting rooms. Meanwhile, the, the Workers' International League developed a set of uh, dem skillful demands that basically could be summarized in the following idea. They said, yes, we want to fight Nazi Germany, but we cannot trust the capitalist government in Britain to do so. And they developed a whole series of explanations, including, for instance, what had happened in France, where the capitalist class capitulated to uh, uh, Nazi Germany rather than arm the workers. And, they, and, and also the fact that the British ruling class had been, uh, had been sympathetic to fascism and, uh, and uh, Nazism in the interwar period. They developed a whole series of slogans about workers' control of industry, trade union control of military training, the election of officers, and uh, with the exception of a small group of uh, leading comrades who were sent to Ireland for safekeeping, the militants of the, of the Trotskyist organization went into the army with their class. But they didn't just go as uh, normal soldiers. They went in to carry uh, Bolshevik uh, agitation, which was quite successful. The army had created something called the Army Bureau of Current Affairs. Because you see, the British ruling class was, was pretending that this was a war for democracy and all of that. And they wanted to keep the soldiers informed of what was going on. Uh, and so the Trotskyists in the army volunteered to be part of this Bureau of Current Affairs. 
and talk talk to the soldiers about current affairs. And so and so they did very successfully. There was a comrade called uh, Arthur Ledbetter, and he was posted in Benghazi to today's Libya. And he says, in a letter to the Socialist Appeal, he says, I decided to take an active part in the ABCA scheme, the Army Bureau of Current Affairs. Of course, its limitations were known to me, fully appreciated by me, he says, but I felt that I could uh, impart some knowledge on a subject about which large numbers of troops were ignorant and therefore also find out what the soldiers were thinking. So he says, accordingly, I started to lecture on trade unionism. In 16 months of service, I gave around 60 to 70 talks. I also gave around 20 to 30 times a lecture on socialism and capitalism. And this is the interesting part. Says, in addition, whilst in Sidenaika, I was elected the prime minister and home secretary of the Benghazi forces parliament. So the army high command in their foolishness had created something like a forces parliament to which people could be elected. And a Trotskyist was elected prime minister. He says, we had at that time some 60 members in the house and an average attendance of 100 in the strangers gallery, i.e. I, the, the viewing gallery. Uh, of course, when, when he then was was uh, sent back to Egypt, the parliament was completely closed down. <laughs> but this was going on throughout the army. There were political discussions, and uh, the mood by the end of the war was uh, a revolutionary uh, mood. There was another guy called Frank uh, Ward, another comrade who was, uh, who was uh, an engineer, and he was sent to the RAF. And he did such a good job of talking about Bolshevism to his fellow uh, Air Force uh, soldiers that the commanding officers of the different units uh, started to uh, send him to another unit because they didn't want him in the in the unit. So if there was another officer that they didn't like, they will send Frank Ward over there to create trouble. And final, finally, after a few months, he had been so effective that they discharged him from the army. Even though he was playing a very good role as an engineer, uh, they had to give him an honorable discharge because they couldn't find any fault with what he was doing. But they certainly did not want the Bolsheviks creating trouble amongst the, amongst the troops. Anyway, just, just to finish on a, on a couple of important points. You see, this, this is all historical uh, stuff uh, related to World War I, mainly. But from this, I think we can draw some general lessons on, on the general position of Marxism towards war. And these are very relevant for today. As I said, the war in Ukraine particularly has thrown everyone into this array in the left, the so-called left and the labor movement. There are people, there are people, even, even, even some communist parties or parties that call themselves communists who support their own ruling class, like, like the French Communist Party, like the, like the Russian Federation Communist Party supporting the, the, the Russian ruling class and so on. There are others who take a pacifist position or who take a pro-war position disguised as a pacifist position. And they say, not only in relation to Ukraine, but also in relation to Gaza, they say, oh, the, the international institutions should intervene. This should be sorted out at the United Nations, which is a position that one has no, nothing to do with Leninism or communism, but also is uh, completely, uh, uh, I don't know which word to use, it's, it's completely useless, it leads nowhere. Uh, the international institutions are just, uh, as Lenin said, uh, uh, a thief's kitchen, a place where the big powers divide the loot amongst themselves. Uh, we can see this very clearly. When the big imperialist powers are able to get the United Nations to pass a resolution backing their interests, they do so. When they are unable, they carry out their interests regardless. How? How many resolutions has the United Nations passed in relation to Palestine? How many resolutions has the United Nations passed in relation to Cuba? <clears throat> in fact, in all of these resolutions, both Gaza, uh, both Palestine and Cuba, the United States has become so isolated that now there's maybe three countries voting in favor only, or four. Yes, it's the United States, uh, Israel, Ukraine, and sometimes some small uh, island in the, in the Pacific, which is completely dependent on the United States for, for money. But even, even now, most of the European powers uh, abstain on this, in these votes. 
so, so ashamed. And finally, there's also some uh, so-called communist parties or left organizations that have adopted the position of defending not their own ruling class, but the ruling class of the other side, which is equally as bad. So our, our starting point should be that of uh, Karl Liebknecht. The main enemy of the working class is at home. And the other question is that I, we already mentioned in, in this uh, conference, in this school, is that now again, militarism is becoming a main political question all over Europe and the advanced capitalist countries. We are told that Russia is a, is a grave and serious danger to European uh, security, and that therefore defense spending must be ramped up everywhere. In many European countries, they're now talking about reintroducing or strengthening the national service, the military service, conscription for young people. And this is, as I said, becoming a main political question, which we should address head on by saying the same people who say there is no money for housing, no money for education, no money for health care, no money for pensions, they're now uh, asking us that, that we must spend enormous amounts of money in, uh, in defense spending, which in most cases will become scrap metal, not even used in any uh, actual uh, war. To the benefit of the war manufacturers, the, the, the weapons manufacturers, whose uh, company's shares shot up immediately as any, any war starts. And so it should be very easy for us to link the two questions together. We must fight against war in order to spend that money in useful social spending. And above all, our main guiding principle should be an understanding that war is caused by capitalism, the driving force towards military spending, towards conflicts between countries, is, is the, the, the struggle, the, the inter-imperialist struggle for markets, resources, and, and uh, fields of investment. And therefore, we should say to the youth, who are quite rightly enraged by the massacre in uh, Gaza, who refuse militarism, we should say, if you want peace, fight for socialism. The only way to put an end to the horror of imperialist war is by abolishing the capitalist system, which, has, which is at the root of it. Thank you very much, comrades. Uh, we'll move on to the discussion. Uh, first up will be Lucy from Brazil, will be followed by Stamatis from Greece. Hello, comrades. Um, Lucy from Br Brazil. Um, yeah, comrades, um, it's okay. Oh, I have to look to you. <laughs> uh, last year, we had the National Cater School in Brazil, uh, which I had a little off on Marxism and war. Uh, I w uh, yeah, it was. I will share with you some lessons I've got from the from everything I have read on this question. Yeah. So we can start asking ourselves uh, and answering why those the war, wars exist, why they happen, which wars we support and which which we do not support, and what is the communist program to achieve the peace. Uh, capitalism is, itself is based on accumulation, concentration, and centralization of capital. These dynamics leads the society to overproduction crisis. And as Marx explained on the Communist Manifesto, the main important way to solve uh, the overproduction crisis is destroying the productive forces. War is the best way to the ruling class to destroy it because, because, at, oh, sorry, because at the same time it destroys factories, schools, hospitals, cities and also kill the labor forces, the workers, and our con life conditions. The imperialism has taken that contradiction to a higher stage. The monopolist capitalism emerged in a world that was already divided. So, uh, to expand itself through the borders, it, it has to be by violent ways, like um, with wars intensify intensifying the colonialism, and dictatorships like in Brazil in the 60s, 60s, mostly in the dominate and backward countries. As Lenin explained on his imperialism book, uh, the capitalists are responsible for the violence. 
it's a complete bullshit when they say about self-defense war or war to defend democracy, to defend the, the democracy. No, they are defending their own prof profit. profits. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reason the NATO, US, Putin, Netanyahu, and many other capitalists want to take longer, more uh, the wars. Under capitalism, the wars are inevitable. The period, period between wars is actually when they are preparing for another wars. Okay, now about the communist program to achieve the peace. We must understand very deeply that, um, so what if, okay, here, um, the capitalist, uh, the capitalism program of peace is actually wars. <laughs> The socialism is the peace. Under socialism, we can achieve a democratic, long-standing, and high-tools, I think this is um, peace. Right, peace, like as Karl Libinik has explaining in his writings on the First World War. Uh, we say civil war, not civil peace. But we, if we just stop here in our explanation, the oppressed masses uh, will ask us: Should I die waiting for socialism or? What can I do right now? And here comes some um, about the importance on the transitional demands during the war periods. Trotsky say, says a lot for us in the Against the Imperialist War and the Proletarian Revolution Manifesto, written on the Second World War, or before, in the pre preparation. Our effort as communists is, is to improve the workers' consciousness and the strength by demoralizing the bourgeoisie in uh, the bourgeoisie of each country explaining that we that they are our main enemy in all nato nato countries we say not bombs but books not welfare but healthcare like in our uh, rcp program on the elections this is amazing because it shows the contradictions to the works on the palestine question we say stop bombing let the humanitarian, oh, this is hard words to say, humanitarian, yeah, humanitarian aid pass. The Palestinians have, uh, people have the right to return. This is important to offer some answers, uh, to, on the, on the present situation they are facing and for them who wants to fight right now. Lenin had no problem to use the slogan for peace, bread and land to move and to connect with the desire of the masses for peace. But this is not the end. We go further. We connect it with the fight for socialism. And, sh and we, we show uh, the real face of imperialism. We must stand against the violent, violent annexations <clears throat> by defending the self-determination. As communists, we do not stand for new borders, new capitalist states. So that comes the importance of the slogan for I, it's take too long, so this is sentence is better to say now. <laughs> uh, only one democratic, secular, so and socialist state on the historical, um, historic Palestine territory. <clears throat> okay, now just to finish, um, to stop the imperialist war, was we need a revolution ro worldwide. Um, so we need to strengthen our forces building strong sections and a strong international. <clears throat> While the imperialists just can offer permanent wars, we stand for permanent revolution. Thank you, comrades. Um, next up will be Stamatis from Greece, followed by Rob Smith from Spain. Comrades, Lenin, in a brilliant attempt to give a scientific definition of what is war, wrote in the paper Social Democrat, uh, in uh, uh, 1915, that war is an immediate and I inevitable outcome of the basic principles of capitalist property. And that in capitalism, there are no other means of restoring the periodically disturbed equilibrium except, except crisis in industry and wars in politics. So in the mind of, of every militant of the labor movement and the youth, there is always the question of what the working class can and must do to prevent or stop an imperialist war when it breaks out. So for the first time in the international Marxist movement, this issue was discussed at the second Congress of the Second International in 1907 in Stuttgart. 
Various opinions were expressed there, and four resolutions were submitted. Bebels, Gieds, Hervé, and Zorez uh, Vajan. The first two, Bebel Ged, correctly posited the connection of war with capitalism. However, they were unclear as to the concrete tasks of the proletariat. The third, Hervé, expressed a pacifist, as Jordi uh, says, semi-anarchist logic, while the fourth, Zorez Vajan, emphasized the right to defend the bourgeois fatherland when it is attacked by uh, other uh, country from outside. In the end, the resolution written by Bebel was adopted, but it was supplemented, supplemented in key points by three essential amendments proposed by Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin. And the final amended document, and not Bebel's original, has a timeless value because, uh, as Lenin wrote in an article in the paper Proletari shortly after the Congress, it precisely formulated the tasks of the proletariat towards the world. The most uh, important point of uh, this resolution is the point that added by Lenin and Rosa and emphasizes that the social democrats should try not only to prevent the outbreak of war or to secure its speedy ter termination when it, was, it has already begun, but to use the crisis created by the war to hasten the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. So some words about the, the resolution of uh, Hervé. The French pacifist pro-anarchist uh, Hervé, who at the end of the next decade became fascist, proposed at the conference that the international should call a general strike every time a war uh, breaks out uh, to stop it, and also uh, not discuss, discussing between uh, just wars and unjust wars. Answered him Lenin in the same article of uh, uh, 1907, emphasized that Hervé did not understand that the proletariat cannot renounce participation in revolutionary wars, but also that the possibility and the methods of answering by the proletariat to a war that is imminent or uh, has already uh, broken out depends on the conditions that prepared the war, but, but also on the conditions that the war has already created. So the idea, the idea of pacifist and uh, anarcho-syndicalist that the call for a general strike can pre prevent or stop a war overlooks the fact that the situation on the eve of uh, war is usually the least favorable for a general strike. Unless, of course, we are talking about a general strike that will be part, will be part of a revolutionary situation and the harbinger of the seizure of power by the proletariat. In any other case, the call for a general strike cannot stop the war. Trotsky, in his uh, writings in uh, 1935, called this general strike, this, this kind of general strike, the most reckless and unfortunate of all possible types. And he explained that this slogan, it might be useful uh, if all the previous developments in the country ha have put revolution and armed rebellion on the agenda. I mean, uprising. Trotsky explained that the bourgeois government on the eve of the war feels stronger than ever, and thus is not frightened by uh, the slogan for a general strike. The patriotism accompanying conscription, together with the terror of war, renders the attempt at a, uh, uh, for a general strike futile. And indeed, when the First World War uh, broke out, not only uh, uh, did we uh, not have a general strike anywhere, but the very anarchist syndicalist leaders in France who supported the slogan of the general strike took over ministries in the war government of the Holy Union. Trotsky, in the document The War and the Fourth International in 1934, explained that also the other pacifist and anarchist slogan, the slogans of uh, ultra-leftist currencies, current, currents, such as uh, the refusal of military service, passive resistance, desertion, sabotage, etc., come in contradiction to the methods of the proletarian revolution. He emphasized that the duty of a revolutionary who enlists is simply to remain a revolutionary, to learn to use weapons, to explain the trenches, in the trenches, the class significance of war, to gather around him the dissatisfied, to unite them in nucleus of discussion of the party's ideas and slogans. However, he added that it will be childish to believe that with propaganda alone, the entire army can be won over 
to the side of the proletariat, thus rendering the proletarian revolution itself unnecessary. Propaganda and agitation can create a revolutionary nucleus and sympathies for the revolution in the army, but beyond this, they can do nothing else. The army can uh, side with the proletarian only if the proletariat itself has shown to the army, in practice, the ability to fight the power. So, as uh, was demonstrated in World War I with the Bolshevik Party, the most decisive weapon of the workers in the struggle against war is the Revolutionary Party. But even for a Revolutionary Party, when a war, a war breaks uh, out, nothing is guaranteed. For example, the Bolshevik Party at the beginning of the war in 1914, despite, despite and against Lenin lines, Lenin's line, could not resist the chauvinist poison. For example, the Bolshevik group of deputies in Duma jointly issued together with the Mensheviks a social patriotic statement. While in the trial of the Bolshevik deputies of Duma, all the accused, except Muranov, together with their theori uh, theoretical uh, guide, Kamenev, were clearly differentiated from the deficit view, the general deficit view of Lenin. So, in order to correct these mistakes along the way, as it, uh, well, uh, it is well known, the role of uh, Lenin was decisive. And with this, it was proven that in order to turn the war into a victorious revolution, not only the Revolutionary Party is needed, but also the existence of the appropriate Marxist leadership within this party. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, it will be Rob from Spain, followed by Sarah from Britain. Hello, comrades. Uh, I wanted to add to Jorge's last point on military spending. Uh, this has become a central political question due to its drain on public spending, and we should take this cause up in our agitational work. World military expenditure rose by 6.8% to $2.4 trillion in 2023. This is the highest level ever recorded and the ninth consecutive year of growth. It's an absolutely mind-blowing amount of mon money that's difficult to even comprehend. The US, China, and Russia are the top three spenders responsible for more than half of that expenditure. The US spent $916 billion last year alone. It's far above China in second place with an estimated $296 billion and Russia spending $109 billion. Money is being wastefully sunk into the Ukraine war. In April, the US Senate approved a further $61 billion of military support. And in February, the EU chipped in with a little $50 billion. However, this military aid is not sufficient to help Ukraine win the war. As been explained by other comrades, they simply don't have the resources or ability to win. And Zelensky is now even kidnapping people off the street and sending them to their deaths at the front. Israel could not wage this genocidal war on Gaza without military aid from Genocide Joe. In February, the Senate approved an extra $14.3 billion, in addition to the $3.3 billion that they send every year anyway. And that's without mentioning the hundreds of uh, secret uh, military exchanges that the US has been carry carrying out. Before these most recent conflicts broke out, all our governments told us that there was no money to spend on public services. In one country after another, we see infrastructure is crumbling, healthcare is being sold for, for parts to the private sector, and teachers are forced to buy pens and paper for their students as the schools are going underfunded. And whilst they bomb the houses in Gaza, millions of people around the world are also made homeless by the housing crisis. It is estimated that $3 trillion could end world hunger. That's 600 billion more than the total world military expenditure. Just think about that for a second. Instead of spending money to save lives, the bourgeoisie of the world are wasting money on destroying lives. And every year they're spending more. But the masses are waking up to this fact and beginning to resist. 
I wanted to make a final point about the wastefulness of military spending. The US and China are competing to develop weapons to deter each other from going to war. In 2019, the Chinese unveiled a hypersonic missile, which is apparently unstoppable. It changes direction in the air as it goes. And it's very fast, as a good missile would be. Uh, the US were obviously very impressed, but very concerned at the same time. They consider any defenses they can't penetrate to be a national security risk. So in response, they've ordered a fleet of 100 new stealth bombers uh, called the B-21 Raider. And they cost a projected, they will cost, they haven't been built yet, they will cost a projected $700 million per one. And these are supposed to be undetectable. So unstoppable missiles versus undetectable bombers reminds me of that physics phrase, <laughs> unstoppable force and an immovable object, US and China. Uh, in order to produce these sophisticated agents of death, all new machinery and infrastructure has to be created. When the B-21's predecessor, the B-20 Spirit, was made, the cost spiraled out of control. The Americans call this uh, expenditure uh, the death spiral. It turned out the coating that absorbed the radar on the B-20 Spirit uh, didn't work in heavy rain. Obviously, they were going to fight in sunshine. Yeah. It cost so much to fix this problem that the Senate cut the original order of 132 Spirits to just 21 bombers. And it still cost them $2 billion per plane. So these formerly undetectable, unstoppable stealth planes that were commissioned uh, for use in the 90s have now become obsolete. And these new bombers will likely go down the same road to the scrap heap in a short space of time. This competition and cycle of obsolescence is nothing new. In fact, Engels wrote about this phenomenon in Anti-During. He said, soon warships too were swathed in iron armor plating. <laughs> At first, the plates were still thin, a thickness of four inches being regarded as, as extremely heavy armor. But soon the progress made with artillery outstripped the armor plating. Each successive increase in the strength of the armor uh, used was countered by a new and heavier gun, which easily pierced the plates. The modern warship is not only a product but at the same time a specimen of modern large-scale industry, a floating factory producing mainly a lavish waste of money. Just to finish up, sorry. As communists, it's our duty to put an end to suffering and bloodshed caused by the wasteful and destructive capitalist system. We need to mobilize around this question to connect with the anti-war mood in society and link domestic demands for increased public spending to bringing an end to war. To echo the slogan of Fiona's campaign, books, not bombs, healthcare, not warfare. Um, thank you, Rob. We'll take Sarah from Britain, followed by Florian from Austria. Thanks, comrades. I want to make three points. The first is that a major factor of determining our position on a war is the outcome of what either side winning that war will produce. And of course, the example of Ukraine draws a lot of light to this. I want to use the example of an article written criticizing our position by a British sectarian group, the political descendants of Shatman, who support uh, the Ukrainian side and an arms to Ukraine and so on, to explain this idea a little bit. So they said in this article that our position was wrong. And in this article, it says, and I quote, it may seem strange for socialists to take a position on war, which defends, uh, the, which defends the side which is being backed by um, Western imperialism. The author says, I even struggled with it first. <laughs> However, then I thought more and I understood. Of course, he understood nothing. But the example that he uses is that of the Chinese uh, Civil War, the Chinese War of Independence. And he says, well, the Americans were backing um, China for their own imperialist interests. And yet Trotsky still uh, stands in defense um, of, uh, of China in this war. So he says, aha, see, your position is wrong. 
However, of course, the question for us is what did China winning this war mean? The war was, was uh, dominantly fought by the Chinese Communist Party with mass support and involvement behind it. The war in Ukraine, on the other hand, is being fought by reactionaries, bigots, and fascists. And Ukraine uh, winning this war would, of course, not be a win for the Ukrainian workers. It would, in fact, uh, stamp down on the rights of workers organizing. It would raise the, uh, the, the reactionary elements. Whereas in China, the situation was completely turned on its head. So, of course, their position completely falls apart when you look at the reality of what would happen uh, at the end of the war. I also want to make a second point about this feeling that exists, especially around Palestine at the moment, of this need to do something now, this need to fight now. One of our comrades is in a WhatsApp group chat with some soft left anti-war types. And he put a message into this group chat saying that we should um, call for strikes, uh, in strike, political strikes to defend Palestine. And um, one of these activists said in this group chat, well, you can't just call for strikes, that's completely abstract. And of course, there is a truth to this, right? We can't just make strikes happen ourselves. But the irony is that the group that this person came from has been at the head of the anti-war movement since the war in Iraq. I was five years old when the war in Iraq happened, just to give that a little bit of context. And the point is that this group and all of these types, they actually hold back the development of consciousness and the development of a fighting force against war by constantly limiting themselves to what can be done right now. If when the Iraq war had happened and they were at the head of the Million Man March in London, they had said, this movement cannot stop here. We must organize against imperialist wars for, for until capitalism uh, is ended. Then where would we be 20 years later? What kind of force could we have now in Britain if that had been done? But they didn't do that. They limited the movement. They pushed back the movement and they want to do that again. And Lenin actually addresses this in Socialism and War because a discussion was happening about whether the German Social Democrats could have stopped the war. And he says it is not at all a question as to whether the German Social Democracy was in a position to prevent war, nor whether in general revolutionaries can guarantee the success of revolution. The question is... Should we behave as socialists or breathe our last breath in the embrace of the imperialist bourgeoisie? Of course, these, uh, these, these activists um, in Britain that I mentioned in this group chat have chosen the embrace of the imperialist bourgeoisie. And finally, and very quickly, I want to make a point about sectarianism. In Britain, certain layers on the left have tried to attack us for our history with the Labour Party, saying, look, look at how the Labour Party are acting now, and you were in their camp. Of course, we were never in the camp of Keir Starmer and his team because they see things in an entirely sectarian way. They do not understand Lenin's idea that you must always be where the advanced layers are, where you can win people over. As Ted Grant said, if there are recruits to be made in the Boy Scouts, I'll join the Boy Scouts. I think he was maybe a little bit too old for it when he said that. But Lenin actually also addresses this in the collapse of the Second International. You can see in all of this discussion that Lenin is having, <coughs> this fiery hatred that he has for those who have betrayed the Second International. But what does he say about the future of the Second International and his role in it? He says this, The immediate future will show whether the conditions have already ripened for the formation of a new Marxist international. If they have, our party will gladly join such a third international that will be purged of opportunism and chauvinism. If they have not, it will show that a more or less prolonged evolution is needed for this purging. In that case, our party will be the extreme opposition within the old international until a base is formed in different countries for an international working men's association that stands on the basis of revolutionary Marxism. Thank you, Sarah. We'll take Florian from Austria, followed by Marissa from Canada. Comrades, in the spirit of the debate, I have to add one thing first. As we are talking about correctly that the main enemy at home is at home, that also our bootlicking ruling class in Austria has consistently voted against ceasefires in Gaza, and we will not let them go through with that. But uh, to come to the main point of my intervention, 
I want to speak about uh, Germany in the First World War, actually. As Trotsky brilliantly explained in the history of the Russian Revolution, war sharpens all the contradictions in society, in capitalist society. And especially in a big war where the whole of the society is mobilized to fight the war in one way or the other. The army also reflects these uh, growing contradictions very, very sharply. Uh, he wrote uh, about the offensive uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia uh, after the February Revolution in July, June, July. He wrote, one after the other, the ulcers of the old society broke out and destroyed the organism of the army. And you can see that very clearly also in the case of Germany. Uh, so German society was gripped by crisis uh, during the whole war in reality. Even in the winter of 1915-16, there was hunger in, uh, in the working class. Actually, hundreds of thousands died of hunger in the, uh, in the First World War in Germany, which was a result of the blockade, but also by the, uh, of the full um, focus on wartime production um, that happened. And the working class was relatively early uh, starting to grumble and uh, starting to fight back against that. But just to see that empty abstractions don't help, help in politics, the first mass strike against the war actually it didn't come from economic woes directly. But it was a strike mainly in Berlin, but also a little bit outside um, against the arrest of Karl Liebknecht for his anti-war position. That was in June 1916. There were other mass strikes always growing in scope and ferocity in reality. The so-called bread strike, which uh, uh, put in a whole new layer of people not before politicized through these economic demands. And especially uh, the January strike in 1918, which didn't uh, uh, stop at uh, the borders of Austria or Germany. They were, they were, it was everywhere, basically. And the thing that's also interesting, all of these strikes were coordinated and organized by a new uh, vanguard, basically coming from the depths of the working class, uh, unionists um, organized in the revolutionary shop stewards, I guess is the best translation, but starting to link up with, uh, with the communists uh, very early on and starting to coordinate. And uh, the last, uh, the last uh, str uh, of these strikes, uh, the January strike is specifically interesting because it took place uh, in the context of the um, uh, uh, peace negotiations of brest litovsk uh, I think Trotsky's uh, position of neither peace nor war was correct after all, because when uh, when the um, uh, when the German army started to advance, it was very clear to everyone to see what the real uh, case for the war was uh, for Germany. It was a war of brutal conquest and subjugation of peoples. And in reality, on the 3rd of March 1918, when the uh, deal was signed, the uh, German army was already starting to crumble because of that. Um, they took a lot of it to the Western Front to make an offensive there, but uh, they <laughs> at least saved saved it also from the throes of revolution, which were gripping the normal German soldiers on the Eastern Front. So the military command of uh, the German army tried one last hurrah, basically. They started the spring offensive in the yeah, spring of 1918, as you can guess. <laughs> um, uh, they lost. And, uh, but even before the offensive petered out, there was already mass desertion uh, in the West. Uh, there, there was a like a hidden military strike going on with soldiers just refusing to fight. Uh, it is uh, uh, calculated that between 750,000 to 1 million soldiers deserted from the Western Front in this time. And most of the other ones just refused to fight. So there's a report that the 8th Infantry Division, uh, which normally would have had a fighting power of 12,000 men, only had 300 men left um, to fight in October 1918. And that was not at all a, a, a single, single example or something like that. And it's very interesting that uh, because of that, the, the high command of the generals um, that had power in Germany at that time 
they were the ones pressing for armistice. They knew they couldn't continue the war with this army. It would break at the slightest uh, um, explosion. Uh, Ludendorff uh, said in September 1918, one of the two uh, main generals in Germany, he, he put it quite well. He said, every hour delay means danger. <laughs> Um, but there was a section of the army that didn't feel that way. Actually, the Marine was, uh, they, they, they were not used uh, for years at this point. The, the sea, sea warfare, how do you, Navy, the Navy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the generals there were itching for a fight because they wanted to save their honor. <laughs> but the normal soldiers wouldn't die for honor at this point. So when the, gener uh, the, the Navy officers decided is explicitly uh, without telling the uh, high command of the German army that they will have a last hurrah and go out to battle the Brits, the sailors rose up uh, first in Kiel, but spreading very fast uh, to all of the major, um, uh, major um, Navy um, yards. And uh, they linked up very fast with the working class who were only waiting for a, for a time to strike, basically, at this time. And that was the beginning of the uh, November Revolution, the German Revolution. Uh, all the uh, regional kings were brought down. Uh, the emperor were, was brought down. And the German army started to uh, demobilize itself, basically. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the peace that was signed, in reality, the, the, uh, the, the soldiers um, forced uh, the government to, to sign it because they had no army left to fight with. And you can clearly see that uh, on all the revolutionary fighting that was going on afterwards, uh, uh, the government had to form new organizations to fight these things and couldn't use the old army anymore. So, comrade, I think it's very, very important to not, not have a moralistic or romantic view of war and the army uh, specifically, but a dialectical materialist view, uh, which tells us that all the propaganda of the ruling class, that the army is a block that cannot be uh, defeated in every country that fights against each other. We know that uh, it is true what Goethe once said in a quite uh, untranslatable phrase, but I will try. <laughs> that everything that comes into being is destined to be destroyed and the armies of capitalism will crumble with the system that created it and we can do that. Thank you very much, Flo. We'll have Marissa from Canada now, followed by Pascal from Britain. So Article 1 of the United Nations Charter says that the purposes of the United Nations are to maintain international peace and security, uh, develop friend friendly relations among nations based on respect for equal rights and self-determination, to achieve international cooperation, and be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations. And this is pretty much universal universally uh, recognized as a failure um, and has been for decades, even by supporters of the UN. Um, but is the UN really useless? Uh, after all, the USA has sunk billions upon billions of dollars into it, so it's got to be good for something. Yeah. And, and if you want to uh, understand someone's role in history, the last thing you do is listen to what they say about themselves. Uh, the UN is often compared to a world government, and much like the state, it builds and uses a mythology around itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The system built after um, the system of international relations built after World War II, including the UN, International Court of Justice, World Bank, and IMF, um, you know, was part of the dramatic expansion of um, and uh, boom of uh, capitalism, you know, you know, backed by uh, U.S. economic might and military power. But, you know, it, this was not just naked power. This system um, provided a, a cloak of international democracy. Um, after all, uh, Western imperialism had a competitor for uh, world power in the USSR which was very attractive to uh, countries just uh, fighting for independence from colonization. 
you know, compared to uh, what seemed like the victory of communism, what what did the imperialists have to offer? Yeah. Well, well, how about uh, human rights, right? And if you look at, you know, just like the resolutions passed by the General Assembly of the UN, um, which is where uh, every country has one vote and therefore uh, like ex-colonial countries have a majority. Yeah. Uh, it can seem like, um, you know, it, it's got some good stuff like the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, yeah, which contains things like, you know, the right to health care, education, food, shelter, which, um, you know, are things that a capitalist uh, state would uh, never guarantee. Um, of course, the GA can pass whatever it wants um, and never have those resolutions endorsed because it is just the window dressing. Um, the, the real point of the UN isn't to prevent war, but to legitimize war and legitimize imperialism and uh, delegitimize the use of force of, you know, uh, other countries. You know, whether, um, you know, uh, it's uh, taking out Patrice Lumumba in the 1960s or the uh, intervention in, in Haiti uh, up to the current day. Um, L Lenin uh, recognized uh, the role that these organizations play for imperialism uh, regarding the UN's prede predecessor in the League of Nations. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, when, he, when he called it a thief's kitchen. Yeah. Uh, Stalin, on the other hand, contributed hugely to illusions in the UN by bringing the USSR into it. Uh, in one instance, um, in talking about the end of World War II and how to prevent Germany from rising again, Stalin said, this is quoting, uh, there is only one means to this end. Uh, that is to establish a special organization made up of representatives of the peace-loving nations uh, for the defense of peace and safeguarding of security uh, to put at the disposal of the directing body of this organization the necessary minimum of armed forces uh, required to avert aggression and to oblige this organization to employ these armed forces without delay uh, if it becomes necessary. Uh, so he was uh, disillusioned not long after when uh, the rest of the Security Council refused to recognize the People's Republic of China and, and the USSR walked out of the Security Council, allowing it to then endorse imperialist intervention in Korea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, the UN is not a world government. So the veil of mythology around it is like a lot thinner. Um, with the state, uh, the ruling class ultimately ma maintains control, even if, like, it loses in court or it grants some reforms. Um, you know, with, with the nation state, the ruling class maintains control, even if it grants some reforms. Um, but, like, the U.S. isn't going to make concessions to international law and threaten its own interests just for the sake of imperial, uh, appearances. Mm -hmm. Um, which is why the U.S. has always ignored the U.N. and its institutions when they turn against it. Uh, whether it's the ICJ ruling against U.S. Uh, intervention in Nicaragua yeah, or um, refusing to back the second Iraq war or um, the over 100 resolutions con condemning Israel. Uh, this means that those who work to maintain illusions in the UN look even more ridiculous than the standard uh, reformists. But of course, uh, you can see why international organization would be attractive to honest people, um, because so many of the problems that, that we face are international. Um, but uh, under capitalism, um, such organizations will always be a den of faves. Um, and the only basis for real internationalism uh, is communism. Thank you very much, Marissa. We'll take Pascal, followed by Paras from Pakistan. Hogan mentioned wars of oppressed nations for national liberation and said they are progressive and we should support them. 
I think this is a, a very interesting and important point, and I want to try and develop this a little bit further. It is a complicated que question for Marxists, mostly because, historically speaking, it belongs to the period of the bourgeois revolution. But like so many things, the bourgeoisie left it to the workers to finish it. Many who like to call themselves Marxists are incapable of understanding this, but it is encapsulated in Trotsky's idea of the permanent revolution. Such a situation brings with it both challenges and opportunities for the working class. But what is indispensable above all else, if we are to succeed, is the tactical flexibility, the concrete approach of Lenin and Trotsky. One book I would recommend on this is In Defense of Marxism by Trotsky. He has a lot of concrete analysis on, on many different wars in, in the 1930s and 1940s with very different characters. And, and from these concrete examples, he draws out and teaches you very general lessons about the way Marxists should approach war. Firstly, we support wars of national liberation, even if they have a reactionary leadership and despite that reactionary leadership. One of the sharpest examples of this is the unification of Germany in 1870 and 1871. Because of a sequence of historical circumstances that I would greatly enjoy but don't have the time to explain, uh, this took the form of a series of wars which in form were wars led by the Hohenzollern king of Prussia and the Junker aristocracy. But they were wars driven by the need for a national market of developing German capitalism. It was essential for the development of the productive forces and therefore progressive. This is uh, why Marx and Engels supported uh, the war of Prussia against France in 1870, which led to the formation of the German nation state. Trotsky explains that, of course, this justified neither the general historical role of its dynasty or even so much is its existence. And Marx and Engels entered into opposition to the war as soon as the Hohenzollern continued it as a war of annexation. Trotsky also gives the example of the invasion of e Ethiopia with its feudal monarchy by fascist Italy in 1935. And he explains that we should, of course, support Ethiopia. So we are in favor of wars of national li of liberation and against imperialist war. So far, so good. But how do we know what the character of a certain war is? Why is it that Ukraine is not fighting a war of national self-defense while Palestine is? We need to learn to think and analyze uh, the plethora of facts at our disposal using dialectics, the method of Marxism. Otherwise, you can make all kinds of mistakes. Both the war in Ukraine and the genocide in Gaza are excellent examples of this. I think Sarah covered the, the question of Ukraine very well. On on Gaza, an Italian comrade told me of a sect here in Italy um, who they have read uh, apparently a little Lenin, but very little Lenin. They have only read a, a little Lenin, very little Lenin. And so their position on the question of Israel-Palestine is that the main enemy of the Palestinian working class is at home and that therefore their main task is to fight Hamas at this moment in time. Ironically, this is something about which the sectarians can agree with genocide Joe. This is, this is not our method. Of course, we cannot divorce our analysis of either war from our analysis of imperialism. After all, imperialism is not a policy of this or that nation, say the United States or Russia, but a world system, capitalism in its monopoly stage. Both Ukraine and Palestine exist within this world system, but they occupy completely different positions. This is a big part of why, why the, the effects of their victories would be so different, as Sarah mentioned. Um, Sarah spoke about what the outcome of a Ukrainian victory would be. Uh, whereas the victory of, of Palestine wouldn't just land a blow against any one imperialist power, but against the imperialist system itself. And capitalism in its imperialist face can only exist because there are dominated nations. Therefore, the liberation of Palestine would land a mighty blow against capitalism itself. And of course, as we've explained, its freedom is intimately connected to the struggle for socialism in the whole region. We must not be sentimental in our analysis of war. The rights of small nations will always be trampled underfoot under capitalism. Therefore, their independence is not our chief consideration. For us, that is the struggle for socialist revolution. And we will orient ourselves and use every event to further the struggle with all our might. This is the only way through which national self-determination can be guaranteed and the only way to end war once and for all. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much to Pascal. We'll take Paris from Pakistan. And if we have time, we might be able to squeeze in Arturo as well. From uh, comrades, the central idea of this discussion is how interestingly wars and revolutions are in, uh, related to each other. History shows many wars gave birth to class wars and revolutions. So the communist policy on this question is very important, obviously. Revolutions can be won and either can be defeated on this uh, question. Great Russian Revolution is the biggest example. That revolution was born objectively from First World War and subject, subjectively by the correct scientific uh, policy of Lenin and his comrades on this question. Unfortunately, the latter was absent in Germany and the revolution was wasted. 
Lenin's position uh, helped working class of Russia to uh, win the masses and the, to take the power. But in Second uh, World War, the situation was different. Second World War uh, also uh, politicized the masses of different countries, but Stalinist policy was against the proletarian military policy and he signed disastrous uh, agreements with the imperialist powers. This policy ruined the communists' work uh, and their uh, uh, mass base uh, all over the world. Let's take the example of Indian subcontinent. Proletariat awak awakening on the rise at that time was on the rise at that time in Indian subcontinent and after the, especially after the martyrdom of Bhagat Singh, uh, workers uh, started to move from economic to political consciousness. That, that's why in 30s, uh, uh, Communist Party of India, that was a Stalinist party, was growing at a good rate. And hundreds, hundreds of thousands of Indian soldiers were used in the uh, Second World War that further radicalized the Indian proletariat and uh, accelerated their consciousness. In, uh, uh, I think, 1942, Ted wrote uh, about the proletariat movement in India, and he explained the serious possibilities of uh, permanent revolution in India. I think the title of the article was the, the, Pro, uh, the Permanent Revolution in India and the Role of British Working Class. But under the directions of Stalin, Indian communists abandoned the movement at all and uh, some of the leaders and even uh, uh, some of the leaders even joined British army to fight fascism. This, this was obvious betrayal, but the biggest crime was the political policy on the grou uh, ground that was uh, the uh, inevitable output of this policy. They split movement on the religious lines. They admitted the imperialist, imperialist position that Indian Muslims are a separate nation and started defending Muslims' rights of, uh, right of self-determination. Hindu comrades were uh, uh, asked to work in Indian National Congress and Muslim comrades were sent to uh, right-wing Muslim League to s serve their uh, right of self-determination. This policy definitely isolated uh, I, this policy definitely isolated the communists uh, from the uh, mass base. In 1946, there was a there was a revolutionary uprising, and uh, in and there was a mutiny in Indian British Army, and uh, the uh, workers of railway and uh, the industrial sector in Bombay and Calcutta they made a huge general strike, but uh, communists were not there to lead them. So the criminal uh, partition, brutal partition of Indian subcontinent took place. After five years of partition, when movement was completely uh, decisively defeated, these uh, communists in British army, they tried to, uh, uh, they attempted a coup in military and failed. Communist party was banned after that. In late 50s, first uh, martial law was uh, enforced in Pakistan. Then there took place, uh, war between India and Pakistan in 1965. That war also accelerated the class contradictions and gave birth to the great 1968-69 revolution. The frequency of this revolutionary movement was equal in both western part of the country and the eastern part that is called Bangladesh nowadays. Because of the defeat of uh, revolution, uh, nationalist leadership, uh, nationalists took leadership in the uh, eastern part Pakistan and India uh, are uh, went again uh, on war uh, to 1970 in 1971 to establish the order and to save the system. This is how the wrong political positions and cowardice of the uh, Stalinists once again led to another partition on nationalist lines. We definitely support the Bengal's uh, freedom, but at the same time, the uh, uh, the overthrow of capitalism was real possibility at, at that time if the communists took the Leninist lines. And after that, the uh, Pakistan state become the so-called frontline ally of US, uh, in fact, the puppet of US uh, in the uh, Cold War against Soviet Union. Since then, Pakistan army is consuming a major part of surplus value and the military aid from uh, value, uh, surplus value created by the working class of Pakistan and the military aid from US and playing Buna Partist role 
not only in martial laws but so called democratic governments as well armies are generally supposed to be the war machines but this is not the case now in pakistan pakistan army has in fact become a cartel of property dealers there used to be a time when they had some uh, sport in petty bourgeoisie or in middle classes but now they are totally exposed especially uh, when on 5 august 9 uh, 2019 india changed the status disputed status of kashmir and uh, uh, made uh, significant changes the role of pakistan army was uh, seen by pub, uh, masses uh, in pakistan clearly and uh, the, this uh, on this kashmir question they were using a lot of the defense budgets and, and their main slogan was that that we will uh, free kashmir from indian occupation and after that they now have no moral authority uh, 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 left uh, to r- rule in pakistan and now they are not in position to confront to, to wage any war uh, with india but they are at uh, constantly at war with their own people with political uh, workers with freedom uh, uh, lovers with uh, uh, trade union leaders activists and it doesn't mean that if they are very weak uh, that, that, that they will not go to have any kind of uh, military adventure once again especially in case of any movement getting out of control they will definitely use their rift with uh, uh, india and now even they have some uh, very disputed relationship with uh, afghan taliban especially if this uh, kashmir movement further develops prog- on progressive lines on uh, uh, and uh, achieve some more revolutionary milestones they might once again initiate uh the war like situation with india so comrade my time has ended but i think so that the uh, the war uh, their tactics to use uh, uh wars to uh, to uh, derail the political consciousness i think that is uh, not on uh, that is already exhausted and the real war is class war that is pre- being prepared in pakistan and the whole region under the surface and we are preparing to and definitely we are preparing to intervene and to lead and to win that war under the leadership of revolutionary communist international Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paris. Um, Arturo has taken himself off the list, so we'll bring in Jordi in a second. Uh, just one final plug again for the book, the Lenin uh, collected works on no, well, Lenin selected writing, sorry, on imperialism and war, with the introduction by Jorge, who will now summarize the discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, comrades, it's been a very uh, wide-ranging discussion and very interesting one. And so I will not have time to deal with all the points that have been raised. But let me start by saying one thing. Uh, when when I was asked by the comrades from Well Read to uh, uh, collect this selection of uh, Lenin's writings on the imperialist war, I I of course knew some of the main texts that had to be in it. But then I went. I went through the Lenin's collected works for this whole period and I have to say that I I personally learned a lot from uh, working on this book. You can see the evolution of the different uh, arguments, the main ideas that Lenin is stressing at each point. Uh, he is is uh, is really a genius in fact. <laughs> so, yeah, just to say I I strongly recommend everyone to get a copy of this uh, book because what what is perhaps most amazing about it about lenin's writings on on war is how relevant they are for today yeah many details have changed it's uh, it's over 100 years later but the essence of imperialism is the same and basically the marxist position on war is based on that question and if you start from these general principles you cannot go very uh, far wrong however uh one thing is general principles the other thing is the concrete uh, application to each conflict or each war which is not not so simple there are many different factors involved also war i think i think is um 
Stamatis said that, that uh, at the beginning of the war is when the government is strongest, i.e. when the propaganda, the war propaganda of the government has its biggest impact on the masses. And that's when it's most difficult to have a correct class independent position. One comrade mentioned the IMT uh, uh, thesis on the Ukraine war. And I think that we can be proud that we took a principled position on the question of this uh, war. And that if today you read what we, what we wrote at the time, you can see that that position has, has, uh, has stood the test of time. And the, the position is based on, on the main principle that the enemy of the main enemy of the working class is at home. And that, and that applies for the majority of us who are in, in uh, Western uh, European US uh, countries that uh, on one side of this war, NATO countries, it also applies to Marxists in Russia. For, for Marxists in Russia, the, the main enemy is also at home. And it finally also applies to uh, revolutionaries, to working class activists in Ukraine. The, the main enemy is also at home. But of course, there are many other contributing, complicating factors that you need to take into account. And you need to be able to translate these general principles into concrete slogans that can allow you to intervene and connect with uh, first the most advanced layers. Making, uh, making a mistake on the question of war can uh, lead you very far down a reactionary path and even, and even destroy your organization. Because this is a fundamental question. I wanted to mention, for instance, I, I, I referred in my lead-off to the, the position of the British Trotskyists during World War II, but this, this position was in, uh, in stark contrast to the position that the Stalinists took. In the, in the first part of the war, the Stalinists said that this was an inter-imperialist war and that the, the workers should have nothing to do with it. But then suddenly, when by su surprising Stalin, which didn't expect this, Germany attacked the Soviet Union in 1941. The Stalinists everywhere did a somersault and started arguing that this was no longer a war, uh, an, an inter-imperialist war, but rather, listen to this, that this was a war between democracy and fascism, and that as a result, the workers, the communists, had to support their own, their own democratic governments. Not only support their own democratic governments, but put an end to strikes, declare a wartime coalition uh, and suspend all agitation against the government. This position led the British Communist Party to be a st strike-breaking force for most, most, of the, most of the war and therefore allowed the, allowed the Trotskyists to build a, a, an industrial base, a strong industrial base. Meanwhile, the Communist Party was in an alliance with the Tories. And this was one of the slogans of the Nice by-election in 1944. When uh, the Stalinists said uh, a vote for the Trotskyists is a vote for Hitler, and the Trotskyists said a vote for the Communist Party is a vote for Churchill. But this is bad enough. But in uh, colonial countries, which Comrade Paras referred a little bit to, support for democracy against fascism meant that the Communist parties were supporting the imperialist colonialist powers that were subjecting these same countries in in India, for instance, in Cuba, this policy meant that the Cuban Communist Party entered into an alliance with Batista because Batista was on the side of the United States and, and therefore somehow was on the side of democracy against fascism. And the Cu Cuban Communist Party was not only legalized, but had two members in the, in the cabinet. Now, when it comes to, to war, sometimes, there is a uh, tick or, or a tendency by, by some anti-war activists to, to find a very crude explanation for the, for the reasons for that war. They say, they say, oh, this is a war for oil. Okay, sometimes it is. But it's not always a direct material uh, resource that's the cause of the, of the war. For instance, there are, there are economic reasons for the war in Ukraine, but I will argue that this is not the main factor. Some people say, oh, the Americans are already buying the land and, and there's oil and this and that, and that's the reason for the war. No, in reality, imperialist powers go to war, yes, sometimes directly for the control of one particular resource, but in many other times, this is only an indirect reason for that war. Imperialist powers go to war for spheres of influence, i.e. 
not, not one particular resource, but the general control of an area of the world where there are resources and fields of investment, of course. So some, sometimes, go, they, they go, sometimes wars are, are caused by a weak government trying to find a, a, a foreign uh, excuse to divert attention from their own problems. And this was a very strong factor in the bombing of Libya by France and, and uh, Britain just a few years ago, which the United States weren't very happy about, and they had to pay the price. Now, uh, in relation to this question, Lucy, Comrade Lucy from Brazil mentioned this, this uh, idea that uh, wars serve to destroy the productive uh, forces. And, and this is true. Wars do destroy productive forces. But I, I don't think that it will be correct to say that capitalists go to war in order to destroy productive forces and deal with, somehow deal with overproduction. I don't, I don't think that's the, that's the case. Although it has to be said that, for instance, after the Second World War, the massive destruction of productive forces that had uh, been, been the, was the result of the war was one of the factors, not, all, not the only one, but it was one important factor for the big economic upswing after World War II, which led to a massive development of the productive forces. Rob from uh, Spain de dealt with the question of military spending. This is a very important question that we should uh, use in our agitation. I think the figure he gave is that military spending in one year is two point worldwide is $2.4 trillion. I just uh, did a quick Google search for how much will it cost to end with to end world hunger? And the figure I got is 267 billion, i.e., 10 times less what it costs, what is spent in, in, uh, in uh, weapons every year. We really need to uh, use this to the full extent because it, 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 it brings out the, the, the madness of uh, the capitalist system. Now, um, Comrade Flo from uh, Austria, in his very interesting intervention, said, said that he thought that uh, Trotsky was right on Brest-Litovsk. <laughs> <laughs> I am not totally sure about this. But in any case, it was a, very mo it was a moving picture, right? Well, was Trotsky right on the 21st of January or was he right on the 26th of January? <laughs> of course, Trotsky's position also changed as the concrete conditions changed. And I will say that in any case, the main, the main difference in the debate about Brest-Litovsk was the difference between the ultra-lefts on one side, who had, who had this very nice, principled, if you want, idea of waging a revolutionary war, completely, as usually the ultra-lefts are, completely out of touch with real conditions. And then Lenin and Trotsky on the other side, who had a common position that a revolutionary war was not possible, and they had a difference, which was an important difference, but secondary in relation to the other one, about the exact timing of, of when to sign the peace or not. And in fact, of course, Lenin only gained the majority when Trotsky changed his vote, which, which they had agreed to do. Trotsky and Lenin had discussed this beforehand, and Trotsky said, yes, when, when, when the German offensive starts, then I will change my vote. That, that's my position. But I would like to highlight this again, because th these were very sharp debates that were taking place inside the Bolshevik party. And these debates contained no personal animosity, which allowed people also to uh, change their position uh, on the basis of arguments and changes in the concrete conditions. Because for them, for them the, the general interests of the revolution were first and foremost. And this is also in relation to something I said in the, in the lead-off. In 1914 and 1915, Lenin used really strong language attacking uh, Trotsky's position. Some, some of it was justified, some of it maybe not so much. But nevertheless, two years later, the two of them worked together as a bloc in leading the, the revolution. There is a lesson there for, for, for the way we should conduct uh, polemics and, and debates, which I think is the way we do. No, not by using very strong words, but uh, so, sometimes strong words might be necessary, but always should be taken as a political question, not as a personal attack or anything like that. Some other comrade, I think, I think it was also uh, Florian, said that uh, war sharpens all contradictions also inside the army. And there are many very in interesting historical examples of this. Of course, the, the Bolsheviks winning the, the Petrograd garrison is, is the most important one. The, Je 
the German Revolution of 1918, which, which he explained is another very important one. But there are others which are uh, maybe a little bit less known that I, should, I think we should develop material on, like the extreme demoralization of the, of the US Army during the Vietnam War, which took the form not only of uh, mutinous and rebellious uh, activities of the soldiers, like fragging, which consisted in throwing fragmentation grenades onto the mess halls of the officers by the soldiers, the development, the development on different sectors of the front of unofficial truce between the rank and file US soldiers, which uh, put some signs on the helmets or the shoulders to indicate that they will not fight the, the, the National Liberation Front. And the circulation, the circulation of dozens of bulletins and illegal papers amongst the soldiers to uh, develop political ideas and connect it uh, amongst each other. War often leads to revolution. One, one U.S. high-ranking officer compared the, the, Viet the, the, the mood amongst the Vietnam uh, soldiers. He said the only comparison is with that of the Petrograd garrison in 1917. And of course, it was, it was revolution that ended the First World War in 1917 in Russia and 1918 in, in Germany. And I will say that we may be surprised by developments in Ukraine where demoralization amongst the population is, is, must be certainly having an impact inside the army. And the idea must be starting to penetrate that we have been pushed into this war by the West. We are supplying the soldiers and the debt. They're sitting, they're sitting back in uh, Washington and uh, Berlin safely. And it is our children who are dying. It's our country that's being destroyed. And at the end of it, we will be forced to sign a peace deal, which is, which is a complete disaster for Ukraine. And that can, and that can lead to revolution in, in Ukraine. Just to finish, I'll say, I'll say this. Le Lenin, Lenin, Lenin put it in this way. In ex he said, capitalists partition the world, not out of personal malice, but because the degree of concentration of capital which has been reached forces them to adopt this method in order to get profits. And here you have it summarized. Imperialism is the source of war. Capitalism creates untold suffering, death and destruction. And in order to put an end to this once and for all, it's is not, is not, is not of any use to appeal to the international institutions, to make uh, empty appeals for peace, but rather we need to organize the forces that are going to overthrow the capitalist system and put an end once and for all to suffering, misery, and oppression and create a world of peace and plenty, which can only be under socialism.